Welcome to the Food Professor Podcast, presented by Cattle, Season 5, Episode 6. I'm Michael LeBlanc. And I'm the Food Professor, Sylvain Charlebois. Our very special guest this week recorded live at uh, Seattle, Montreal, is Marie-Noël Cano, founder of the Cano Intelligence Collective, uh, bringing us, you, the listener, uh, important lessons for food entrepreneurs and executives. Sylvain, I believe you knew Marie-Noël. Uh, and, um, cause it looked like you had met before. Tell me a oh, little yeah. bit about her. I've actually, I've, I've known her for more than 20 years. I mean, she's blossomed into this a- amazing, uh, food, uh, mind, uh, in, in the Quebec sector. She's, she's well known. She's doing great work with different groups. And, uh, yeah, I was delighted that she accepted our invitation to join, join us on the show. Last week I sounded different. I was in Dallas this week. You sound different. Where are you and what are you doing there? Do I sound different? A little bit because you're on the headset. You're not on the, well, the fancy yeah, pod mic. I, I couldn't bring the mic uh, over to uh, to Quebec. It didn't go through customs. So anyways. <laughs> 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 but uh, no, I mean, Quebec City, actually, I just, uh, I just left uh, Parliament here, the National Assembly, where I testified for the first time in my life. I actually said that to the MPs. And the minister, the minister of justice was actually there. And I said, I, I can't believe I've testified in many provinces more than 20 times in Ottawa. I've never testified in Quebec, my, my, wow. uh, my, my home province. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I was really happy to do that. And it was actually about Bill 72, about pricing clarity at the grocery store and oh. tipping mm-hmm. Hmm. Also, rules around tipping. We actually talked about this uh, on our show episodes. a few weeks yep. ago. Yeah, exactly. And so I was invited in to testify and provide and provide my my comments about the, about the bill itself. So tell me a little bit about the process. So the bill has been put forward, yeah. and they would invite at this point. And I think they talked to you before they kind of announced the bill. But at this point, what is your role, or what is role of people like yourself? Uh, actually, I was uh, I was talking to the minister after, and I I did say. They, they were a few things that are unusual in Quebec that I've never seen before. For example, they actually announce witnesses before they even confirm them. Huh. So it's hard to say no. <laughs> <laughs> so Because I was getting phone calls from reporters, from other groups that are testifying. So, oh, uh, I saw you on the list. Uh, I on saw list. you on the list. Uh, what huh. are you going to say? Well, what list? <laughs> I was very I was su- surprised. And the other thing, hmm. the minister himself was actually in the room and he's the first to ask questions. So it's kind of odd. It, That's it, very it's unusual, a little awkward right? because yeah, when yeah. you're talking about the government uh, mm. and you have someone from cabinet around the table uh, listening to everything and asking questions to witnesses, it's kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a bit strange. I, I, I never, I've never seen that in Ottawa. I don't think it's even allowed. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, but in Quebec, that's how they do it. And, and frankly, I really, and the other thing is that when you're a witness, you're the only witness for an hour. Like you got the committee to yourself for an hour. So you can actually you know, talk, uh, as much as you want almost because an hour on your own facing the entire crew is a bit intimidating. That's a lot. And that's so a lot. it's almost, yeah, it's it lot. sounds, it sounds more like you've described as you've described testifying to the Senate. Right, you get a lot more time, uh, a lot more soak time for the folks. So, um, what's the next steps for that uh, for that bill? Is it move forward in the House after talking to some wise people like yourself? What happened? Yeah, well, they're, I think they're meeting. They have another uh, series of uh, of witnesses, and then uh, and they'll actually they'll make uh, changes, and uh, they'll go through uh, the their House of Commons, so the uh, National Assembly, for, mm-hmm. uh, for mm-hmm. readings as, uh, as usual. And, of course, in Quebec, there are, there are no upper chambers, of course. And so it's really up to the National Assembly to decide what, to, what they want to do with the, with the bill. I no, think it's going to go through. but uh, No sober second thought in the province of Quebec is what you're telling me. There's no sobering. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's no, all... It's, <laughs> it, it, it's just a different way to do things. And, mm-hmm. and frankly, when you go to the National Assembly, you, you honestly, the way they think, and I, and I used to be in Quebec, is, it's like they have their own country. I mean, that's really, it, the National Assembly is, is the National Assembly. It's, yep. it, and and, and this, this, the building itself is pretty massive. I don't know if you've been to Quebec City. It's, I uh, have. It's, it's, it's impressive. It's a beautiful building. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very impressive. Yeah. 
Very impressive. All right, well, let's uh, let's move on. Let's talk about coffee. So, uh, first of all, I guess it's a natural yeah. for us to throw out that we're going to be together at the Coffee Association of Canada's conference, November 14th in Toronto. And there's going to there's gonna be a lot to talk about, you, Mr. Chapman, and everybody else, because the price of coffee is skyrocketing. What's going on, and, and do you see an end to this? 13-year high. Uh, a pound of coffee is about $2.70. Uh, it's really because of what's going on in Brazil and Vietnam, droughts, uh, Arabica beans are difficult to grow. And uh, as soon as you disrupt uh, growing conditions, uh, you tend to have more depressed inventories. That's kind of what's going on here. And really every 10 years or so you go through this cycle and, uh, and I don't think it's going to change. And frankly, Michael, I, I don't, I don't think the prices are going to drop. Um, mm. coffee is going to be more expensive and more difficult to grow. That's, that's a fact. And I think everyone uh, at the convention in November will know that. And, mm. uh, so what do you do? And so you stop drinking coffee or you want to sell more coffee, of course. And, and I've actually started to look into the science of lab grown coffee. Mm. And, uh, just in, yeah, just in December, I actually noticed, uh, in a report that in December of 2023, um, a uh, research sin- center in Finland of all countries. You know why I say that about Finland? I don't think of coffee in Finland in the same <laughs> sentence, but okay. Finland is the top drinking c- country in the world. What? On average. I had no idea. A Finnish drinks five cups of coffee a day. Holy jumping. Yeah. And in Canada, wow. it's a little less than two. Wow. Wow. So hey, they, they love coffee. Is you know this, why? Because uh, it's freaking dark all day long. <laughs> Perks them up. <laughs> Perks them up. Hey, is this exactly. a, is this a good opportunity to talk about? Uh, Ara- you know, we talk about one type of bean, the arabica bean. But is it time to talk about robusta? I mean, there are two types of beans, and robusta is seen as the. Do I want to say inferior? It's often in instant coffees and other coffees. Is this? Uh, is this affecting the robusta as well, or well, is this the Arabica for... bean? The popularity of Arabica bean is, is Starbucks legacy, right? Uh, mm. Starbucks got people to want uh, a bitter coffee around the world, and so that's why Arabica became that that benchmark. But you're right, absolutely. I think it's time to think about other uh, other types of beans and uh, that could actually grow successfully in other growing conditions. But I actually do think that at some point Canada will become a coffee maker a mm. coffee producer uh through uh cellular agriculture i, I think it's inevitable yeah and it, it's because they've what they've perfected in december in finland is the taste and the aroma uh they actually had a bunch of people uh testing the real stuff versus the cellular uh coffee stuff and half the time people couldn't make the difference wow 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 and of course the more they make, the better the prices get for that kind of. Yeah, exactly. And so, there, and there's lots, lots of money being poured into these kinds of, of projects. And uh, and frankly, I mean, co- co- coffee is one of the most uh, common, commonly traded uh, commodities in the world. And so, and and India and China, both nations, we're talking billions of people. Mm-hmm. They're drinking more uh, coffee. They're 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 pushing aside tea. So. It's I, I don't honestly I, I don't see how we can get out of this thing without really looking into uh, cellular agriculture or cellular coffee uh, right, essentially. Right. Let's talk about uh, the U.S. port strike. So we mentioned it uh, last week. I was in the U.S. and people were starting to think about, well, if this happens, do we run out of bananas? I mean, Americans are not really used to port strikes. Now, of course, in the in the retail sector and hard goods and soft goods, you could see it by the numbers. They've had huge record deliveries in June, July, yeah, and August. Quite a bit. Yeah, they 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 kind of got ahead of it in case there was a strike. Much like you know, businesses in Canada kind of tried to get ahead of the rail strike, but yeah. you can't really get ahead of it with fresh uh, with fresh food. What I wanted to ask you about. I mean, we're now day two of a pretty what is it? First time in. 40 years, but is there any impact or what impact do you foresee up here in Canada for the port strike, if any? Well, to, to answer your question, you got to look at the top companies being impacted by this. Like who, who, which company would, uh, would want, would uh, do need those ports. Uh, and by the way, to make sure that everyone understands, it's not about toilet paper. 
we we are a sovereign continent around toilet paper. I saw, <laughs> you probably saw reports today that people were hoarding again. They were panic buying. Yeah. Well, because of all the reports. So they actually went out and bought, bought toilet paper. And I'm going, that's that's a perfect example of how consumers can be irrational because it doesn't make any sense. Uh, they, they, the toilet paper doesn't arrive on boats ever. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But Walmart is a top uh, customer of these ports. Amazon is a top customer of these ports. PepsiCo. Uh, Nestle North America. I mean, you can think of how these sports can impact mm. uh, the North American market. But here's the other thing, uh, Mike. In the last 18 months in Canada, we've seen five labor disruptions uh, five. affecting Canadian logistics. Yeah. And more and more companies are using the uh, uh, American routes to service Canada. And, mm. uh, of course, those routes would include these sports. 14 of those sports are larger than our largest sport, which is Vancouver. I mean, mm. it's just lots of stuff uh, is is coming into America with these sports. And so – and because of the hoarding going on, I actually thought – like most companies actually for, bought for, bought for probably about two weeks' worth of food and, and stuff. Uh, if people start panic buying uh, for a few days, that will – get shorter. I mean, it's, you're going you're gonna to run out of stuff. And American companies will prioritize the American market. And when you look at Walmart and Amazon and other companies that are going to be impacted by, by the port situation, my guess is that at some point, Canada, Canada is actually going to be impacted at some point. I don't know how you, you're reading this, but I, I, don't see, I don't see this as being a good thing. Going into October, you, American Thanksgiving is seven weeks away. You got the American election on top yep. of that, complicating yep. things politically. Yeah, it's not great. Yeah, it's very. It's it's a um, uh, a. It's amazing. So many people are paying attention already, basically to to oh, what the media is, a, is all over this. We'll see. I mean, we'll see how long it is. We, you and I, were talking off mic about if if this was is this good for which party, bad for which party in, in Canada, you know. The rail guys were out a day, and they were legislated back. I don't really see that happening in the U.S. in the current climate. Uh, so you know, I, well, the, the Port of Montreal, th- the mm-hmm. three days at the Port of Montreal was a statement, was a message. Yeah, what's going on in the U.S. is implemented chaos. Mm-hmm. I, I uh, deliberate chaos. I, I don't see it out of way. I think there's there's you got forty five thousand people who actually understands the power of context, a political context. I guess we should mention uh, congratulations to the grain handlers. They That strike has been resolved, right? They're back to work. Yeah, so, last Friday. That was done. Kind of like and a whack-a-mole uh, game, like a whack-a-mole supply chain game, you know? <laughs> Take- well, that by the time this episode gets aired, the Port of Montreal uh, strike will, 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 be, will be over. So congratulations to them too, I guess. <laughs> I guess, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we, we, I, we'll keep a close eye on it. I mean, at, at what? Let me ask you this question to kind of ra- uh, round it all up. At what point do you think, you know, at some point, is this two weeks? If the strike goes on for two weeks, one week, like it, if you're in your estimation, when would we start to feel it in Canada? Uh, after I would say after, after two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Yeah. After two weeks two plus, weeks. we'll start to. And it will last over two weeks. I think. I don't. Th- mm-hmm. I don't see how this is going to end like soon. The incumbent really is is Biden, and President Biden seems pretty clear. Uh, it's 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 the they're playing the same they're using the same playbook as Ottawa. Let 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 bargaining prevail, which is fine, but uh, without appreciating how valuable our food supply chain is, it's mm. really. Uh, unfortunate. It's really bad timing, but I, my guess is that I would venture to say that the 45,000 employees who are on strike know very well it's bad timing for the White House. All right. Well, let's uh, let's leave that there. Let's talk about a couple of things before we get to our interview. Uh, talk about, since we're in supply chain, let's talk about supply management. Bill C-282. Why <laughs> is it? What is it? Uh, why it's going to pass? Yeah, so in a nutshell, so Bill C-282 would provide uh, immunity, I guess, uh, to uh, supply-managed sectors, which would include, obviously, eggs, poultry, and dairy. And so this this bill was designed 
Immunity uh, from trade negotiations, right? From trade negotiations in the future. And, of course, people may think, well, we got all the trade negotiations. We got all the trade deals we needed. We need. Not exactly. I mean, there's, there's China out there. At some point, maybe we will want to sign with them. There's the U.K., with Brexit, we need to negotiate with them. So there are really key areas where there, there are interesting things to do. Uh, but uh, if you recall last year, uh, the UK actually walked away from, from, from the table negotiating with Canada because of supply management or because of the, of the condition that Canada was asking about supply management. So mm. C-282 would basically take off the table Anything that has to do with supply management from the beginning, like right on the get go, because when when two mm. parties actually sit down to negotiate a trade deal, uh, you basically typically would see both countries saying, "Well, these are the things that are absolutely off the table." But well, 282 would actually clarify that, and uh, and that's why the block is using 282 as a uh, negotiating chip uh, against the liberals right now. Because, but my I. Honestly, I, I, I think this is more about uh, political rhetoric than anything else because who would be against 282 politically? I don't know. You're a free market thinker, I suppose. I, I don't know. Why would the dairy you? Dairy farmers of Canada can kill any political career in a nanosecond. Hey, Why would you be stupid right. enough to vote they against They are them? a very powerful lobby, which uh, reminds they me. They own Ottawa. Uh, you did a post that was very intriguing. You tweaked that uh, you did some research talking about supply management on dairy that you looked at how much wastage there was in oh, dairy. Oh, yes. <laughs> right? You put, that on, you put that on X. Now, yeah, we got, uh, we got what's an article. It gonna, what's it going to take for me to get you to reveal you the results of that? <laughs> Not tonight. Oh, <laughs> No, but stay tuned. I mean, I think we're a couple of weeks away from uh, being okay. able to share some stuff with uh, with our audience. Uh, yeah, so we actually looked at. If you remember last year, February of 2023, this uh, Ontario dairy farmer was asked to dump 30,000 liters of milk, and the dairy yep. board said, "Well, it's his fault because there's not a managed his herd, there's not a managed his farm." And I and I, I've been saying this is this this is this is common practice, man. This is this happens all the time. Mm. And he had the guts to post himself dumping milk because nobody can see milk being dumped because all valves like uh, uh, faucets are inside barns. And so uh, there's there's a lot of milk being dumped in Canada. We just didn't know how much. Mm. Now we know. Oh, yes. All right. There you hear it. it, it and not only that, what I'm really proud of is that – so I'm proud of two things. One – uh, this this work is with an American scholar and a scholar from Europe. I'm the only Canadian, okay? And two, it's going to be published in the world's top uh, environmental economics journal, wow. which is great. Fantastic, fantastic. And, and tell us when you can give the listeners an exclusive sneak peek. We're just waiting for the weeks. publisher to give us uh, the draft. That's okay. probably when we can we can start talk, talking about it. Then we, so we're, weeks, not I, months. Fair. Yeah, weeks, it's weeks, weeks, not months. All right, let's get to our great interview with Marie uh, Noel Cano. But first, let's hear from our friends at Cattle. Ever feel like the world of ratings and reviews needed a superhero? Well, enter Cattle, the caped crusader with Canada's largest, most diverse, and daily active consumer panels. That's right, Cattle is not your average podcast sponsor. So why choose Cattle? Because Cattle excels in consumer insights from your consumer while also blazing trails in the realm of ratings and reviews, pioneering the future landscape of user-generated content. Beyond the valuable syndicated receipt data, they stand as unparalleled collector of reviews at scale, irrespective of category or price point. A testament to their impact, partnerships with giants like Walmart, Canadian Tire, and more. Visit AskCattle.com now for an exclusive The Food Professor podcast listener discount on your first review or research campaign today. That's AskCattle.com. Well, we have the pleasure to host today Marie-Noël Cano, someone I've known for many, many years. Marie-Noël Cano from Cano Intelligence Collective based out of Montreal-ish. Montreal-ish. Ish. Yeah, because you're everywhere in Montreal. Yes. Everywhere. Yes. LinkedIn. <laughs> I see you on social media. You're like 
there. You're all my the benchmark, Sylvain. <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> careful. Yeah. Careful what you wish for. Yeah. So welcome to the Food Professor Thank Podcast. Thank you. This yeah. is a great honor. You guys are on my bucket list. This is extremely fun. Well, there, you there you go. Thank you for listening. inviting me. Thank you. So for people who don't know, uh, I've so I've had the pleasure to actually work with you many, many years ago, over two decades ago. I think so. And you were part of the Seattle organization. Yeah, I started my career off at Seattle as a summer job and then they gave me a promotion and they wanted to get me to stick around so I stayed for about four years did two Seal shows it was an amazing experience and it and wasn't going to Toronto at the time no it was a debate at the time so um, yeah. I don't think I should say which year it was but it was a debate at the time yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah a lot of those great relationships I get to find every time uh, I'm in Seal and, and you're one of them and yeah. a lot of people I get to see again I think uh, this is what the, we were talking about bees or earlier. Um, I really got the sting for the agri-food business and uh, left for six years to study uh, yeah. to study for uh, for more PR at another business, but came back to the food industry. To the food industry. Yeah, and, yeah. and clearly, I mean, when you read your stuff, you're super passionate about what you do. So my question for our listeners, what exactly do you do? So after um, a couple decades <laughs> in the food industry with the, a gap uh, in the energy industry, I felt like I wanted to offer the support that I, ha I had always dreamed about getting um, when I was sitting in the corporate communication seat, um, also leading sustainability, which had, which had started to become quite, um, quite one of the goals, actually. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I turned to, um, you know, maybe starting to see if I would work on my own for a while. And then, um, like a lot of entrepreneurs, I went through a cycle of, uh, am, I really, am I really going to do this? And then at every step of the way, the answer was yes. And in 2021, I incorporated my company, and I'm extremely pleased to be chatting with so many brilliant minds and, you know, being back at Seattle, it's like being back in, in the bathtub. I know it's a French expression, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> being back yeah. in the pool. And so uh, it's been great to have those conversations and pilot several mandates, mostly in regards to food because of, of my passion. Yes, I, I don't hide it very well. Um, I'm passionate about, you know, different perspectives that I can bring and that the company can bring to the business world. And so, um, you know, with an approach that is very collective, which is why the company holds that name, um, working mm -hmm. with teams, working with leaders, working with experts. It's is really that making what's a huge difference. Is that difference. what's unique with your approach versus, because there are tons, there are of, tons, tons yeah. of companies out there yeah. trying to make things better for businesses. Yeah. What's the difference? Yeah, a lot of great stuff out there, publicity, marketing, communications. Um, you know, I don't know if we would describe ourselves as a boutique firm. We're definitely uh, past the startup phase. Mm -hmm. um, the approach that we're putting forward is we've been in your shoes. Mm. We've been in your shoes. We get it. Um, we'll help you navigate through it. We'll help you make a plan with your team so that they feel involved with your bosses, with your stakeholders, so that they feel like they're involved and you're all, all targeting the same uh, goals, the strategic goals, the me key measures, the famous key PIs. But it's about also, you know, at the same time as you're doing analysis and context, you need to look a little bit further down the line. So how do you start from the analysis phase, bring, your, bring, bring the client and their goals to destination mm -hmm. through, you know, con concrete operations and, and team engagement. So your clients that you have, do you keep them for a project? Uh, for a long time, uh, how does how does it work when you deal with uh, Cano Intelligence Collective? Uh, we have different formats. Um, the long-term projects are the ones that we can get most involved in, um, but we can come up with uh, you know quick approach to uh, a solution that the client needs. Um, the destination can be far, it can be close. Um, so one of our clients we have had for a couple of years and uh, the project's been renewed, so we're having a really great time working on the longer term um, destinations. And then really it's a really a question of what are the goals and, and how, what's working, what's not working. You know, we like to say, um, if you don't know how to get there, we'll help you figure mm -hmm. it out and, and get you there. Um, and we'll get you there with the reality that you're facing, which is some of the issues that in the corporate world we need as, as supporting companies to understand what's not working and why and not try necessarily to fix it all the time. Just make it work with the situation as, as it is within the company, within the market, um, within the dynamic of the team. 
uh, really working on each person's talent and, and profiles to make it work. Because mm-hmm. the goal at the end of the day is everybody goes home and they know what they contributed to and they know that they were part of it and they want to come back the next day. Mm-hmm. So um, we feel like that you know, collective success is really what makes people want to contribute even more to the results. It, it's not so much about what are our KPIs, just making sure that you can communicate what they are so that people know that what they're coming in for every morning. Interesting. I have so many questions. So when you think about when you go into an engagement and some of it's an assessment and, and you kind of, what's your starting point? Do you have a model that you use? Some people, you know, they use the blue ocean idea. Some people would use more a uh, 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 consulting, you know, what are your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, uh, put it on a matrix. Uh, some might use a, a ladder like technical, functional, and emotional benefits and try to structure. How do you structure the first conversation? And let's call that the discovery process. How do, how do you, where do you start? Yeah, the discovery process is really one of the good terms for it. Um, I've heard all the expressions, the matrix, the tree, the decision tree. I think they're all extremely relevant. The question is, what are we bringing to the table that's different? It's the analysis part of it. What are the dynamics within the group? What are, what are the strengths? What are the talents? You mentioned talents. It's extremely important. Who's at the table? Who can be the best at what? And as a leader, the most... Um, the best way to evolve is really to have that analysis where where are my strengths and where are my not strengths. I don't like to work with weaknesses. I think it's a waste of time because what we're not good at, I mean, you know, what can you do about it? Why you can bo- learn. Why bother? I mean, it's not very motivating. So what what can you delegate to others that they'll make it a success with the, the collaboration? So that analysis phase is super important. Seeing what the dynamics are within the group, having a conversation as how's it going with management? How's it going with the team? How's it going with X or Y colleague? Um, which is going to be helpful to get to to get to the goal. So really it's that whole quick analysis and you know how do you make the first steps so that you can fall into the operational phase with it going as well as possible in those relationships the the work that you've done over the years uh has it been mainly with manufacturing retailing uh production a a bit of everything where's your nexus really so my career, I've had the privilege of working on a lot of fronts. So I started in the trade, so with uh, with Sial. Um, and I like to say there's the industry and then there's the domain. So what did you work at when you worked in that industry? And I've had such a big scope that when I launched my business, I had to shorten shorten the list a little bit. So yeah. there's a lot of stuff. You wanted that, to solve everything. Yeah, I wanted to solve everything. <laughs> and, and, you know, I wanted to find the people who could make me solve everything. But I mean, in the first three years and the next three years, it's really about, um, yes, the food industry, but I've worked in retail. I've worked in restoration. Uh, restoration in English? Uh, food service. Food service. Yeah. Food service. Uh, restauration. Rest- <laughs> restauration is more like <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, I'm not fixing stuff. Oh, well, I fixed stuff. But I got to tell you, I, I mean, you, you, Magna El does not work in English most of the time, and her English is impeccable. Impeccable. I got to tell you. Well, yeah. thank you. Yes. Sometimes the words don't roll out super well, but I did learn English in Kingston. Not a lot of people know about that. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like at where? Like at, at Queens? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I'd like to say that I'm a Queens graduate. I'm not. I uh, graduated English at the uh, local kindergarten that my <laughs> parents sent me to. <laughs> Well, it's an early milestone. It's going yeah, to have early achievement. It's my achievement. first diploma. So to your question, I mean, you know, I, I've I've done work in several amazing companies, um, big and small, and and I think what I what I take out of it the most is is the projects that I learned on. Mm. So I started working on sustainability when it was like a weird word that nobody knew anything about. That's right. Um, I worked on crisis management, media relations. I did corporate communications. I did financial communications. I didn't even know what that was. I had to Google it um, <laughs> to understand what my boss was asking me. And I, I thank her very much for her trust in me. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it's all about... But, but in your business, it's very much about relationships yes. and trust. Who trusts yeah. you and who do you trust to... to for that learning curve, you know, um, it's just been an amazing learning curve, and I, I, I have this, you know, passion to communicate that to leaders. And I know it's not easy, you know, mm. it's not easy to be a CEO, it's not easy to be a COO, it's not easy to be a team that um, needs to communicate because I think it's the word that we say the most in companies. We need to communicate. Well, how are you doing it, and how are you prioritizing it? It's it's funny because Michael and I we were talking earlier today about how. 
uh, poorly the agro sector is doing when it comes to social media and communicating. Uh, I have to ask you, because you're so good at it, do you agree? I think it's a cultural, um, I think it's a cultural piece where it's not seen as a priority and it's, it's not seen as something that's positive necessarily. And that's where the right dose of how you're communicating and what you're communicating on. Um, and especially for women in leadership roles, which I love to work with. Um, I don't know what the word is in French, mais sont, sont gênés. Yeah. They're, um, they're reserved. They're, they're reserved. They're, 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 shy, they're, they're They're afraid of how it's going to be perceived if they're on, yeah. on, uh, on the... They're afraid to be judged. Exactly. So I think that's something that we can collectively work on to make it a safe space. And I always compare LinkedIn to the new office corridor. What do you want to talk about? You know, what do you want people to read about? You know, it doesn't have to be a selfie of you, but do it if that's how you can tell the story. Um, and don't, you're not alone. You know, you don't need to do it yourself the first couple of months. You know, we have a program at, in the business where for three months or six months, you can get some support. Mm. Um, and so just, you know, riding that wave, which is extremely important. I was speaking to both men and women in the last couple of days, how LinkedIn is like, I didn't really believe in it, but I'm realizing all these contacts mm. are being made because mm. the quality of that corridor conversation in the offices that we don't necessarily have anymore, but that in 2024, we can have access to an office corridor that's anywhere in the world or anywhere in the it's, city. It's, it's truly the last social yeah. media platform that's actually useful, despite Microsoft trying to screw it up on a daily <laughs> basis, right? No kidding. Um, so, interesting. All right, I want to, last kind of question for me, and then I'll pass back to, to Savannah. I want to tap into your insights and wisdom uh, I'm going to put a proposal to you. I think that, um, you know, during the COVID era, grocers as a category got a lot of credit for, you know, they were heroes, mm -hmm. right? The manufacturers didn't get a lot of credit, but in, the, in fact, their employees were getting COVID processing food at, at equal to or greater rate. But now that table has turned a little bit. I think the... Um, you know, it, it, whether it's food price or whether whatever it is, the grocers are getting negative feedback, too much so, and the producers are kind of like not getting enough negative feedback when it comes to food costs, for example. It all seems to be blamed at the feet of the, of the grocers. Now, where I'm going with that is trust. And I would perceive that as a category, and we see it from everything from theft to government intervention to the way that the language that the government uses, um, which is obviously political to groups like Reddit that are you know, <laughs> talking about uh, nonsense, but they feel very passionate about it. If you were, and if you had a magic wand, or if you were advising the grocery industry leaders and saying, listen, there seems to be a reputational crisis. I don't know if it's a crisis, you tell me. Um, you already do amazing work. You give millions of dollars to charities. You're in the community, you're doing all this stuff, but it's not enough. What, what would it take start turning that around. What do they need to do that they're not doing today collectively to kind of start fighting that perception, those negative perceptions back and building that back and, and you know, these people storming the walls, you know, they feel free to steal from them because, you know, they're bad. You know, we're in a, not in a great place from that perspective. Reputation and strategic positioning of a brand is mostly about, you know, how leadership is envisioning communications. Um, with, with different stakeholders. So employer branding became a huge thing a couple of years ago, and that's extremely important because your best brand ambassadors, it's super cliche, but your best brand ambassadors are your employees. So to that piece, you know, and I've worked for, for big food retailers, um, and my message was, how do we do things differently? What can, we, what can we do that we have an impact? And part of the conversation that needs to be had is, what are the goals? Because sometimes... The goals are not necessarily where we have that first. Um, so let, let's say the goal is that the politicians don't use as a football <laughs> in a campaign. Yeah. Because it's very convenient for them. And it's ample. And social media, as you know, yeah. like be between your career when you began and today, social media has become quite poisonous and out of control, particularly platforms like X, because it's, you know, libertarian and freedom of speech, which... Uh, we won't debate that here, but social media has taken a power that has a very dark side. So, you know, how do you balance those things and, and think about that from not just where you want to be, but the reality of where you are today? Yeah, I think 
what is the reality in making sure that that comes up to management and that there's an actual... That comes up to management. Yeah, it comes up to management. Listen. And, you know, on my end, when I was leading communications, it, you know, I brought it up. And the beauty of it is we had real conversations about what we could focus on and what we could do and, and how we could do it. And it allowed for some change management to take place. The, the goal isn't to transform everything from one day or even one year to the next. It's to have the communication and the brand positioning and the employer branding as part of the strategic goals. In most cases, it is. The question is always, are we making it a priority on our day-to-day, on a day-to-day basis? And one of the things I like to focus on is, first, you can't focus on 50 priorities. You need to bring that down to like three or six at the most. So to your question, you know, today I'm in a position where I know more about the retail reality than I did before I worked for the, for the great brands that I worked for. But part of it is who's the leadership, what's their culture, what's their vision, what are their goals, and then step by step, how do we make it a priority for them to communicate what they're about, but also to listen. And that mix of earned media and paid media and all the kind of tactical stuff starts to roll in. Right? Yeah, and the authenticity of it is the most important. So if a leader does not believe in it at different degrees or does at different degrees, it's his or her prerogative to do so. And then how do we accompany that person in terms of what the destination is and what the goals are? Because it doesn't always have to be, you know, 100 miles an hour or 100 kilometers an hour. Um, it can be, you know, part of the way part of the time, uh, you know, step by step is how we like to take it. All right. Listen, it was a pleasure to host you to be part of our show uh, at Cial in Montreal. Marinelle Cano, thank you so much for your time from Cano Intelligence Collective. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the show. Thank Montreal. you. You too. Thank you so much. Thanks for being on the pod. I appreciate your support. Safe right. travels. Thanks. All right. Are you following this thing? I've been reading that there's parasites and oysters on the on the East Coast. Are you following that at all? Have you, have you tracked that? No, no, not at all. I've actually had not the time. I actually saw something about it. Uh, tell us more. What's going well, on? Uh, well, uh, maybe you could do some re- uh, talk to your people um, for next episode. What I've been reading is that there's a parasite that is not dangerous to humans, but is uh, fatal to the oysters and is risking or threatening to wipe out some pretty key oyster growing areas in, uh, in the East coast. So mm. let's keep an eye on that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Last That's my thing. homework. Yeah. There you got your home. You got, you got a homework assignment right there. Uh, last thing, uh, congrats to Patterson food groups, longtime president, Daryl Jones. He's been Darryl on the podcast Jones. before. Yes. Absolutely. Great leader. Uh, you'll see him in, if you're in uh, in the west coast of Canada, you'll see his friendly, smiling face on uh, on flyers on Save On Foods, uh, and he has announced he's going to retire. And yeah. his successor will be Jamie Nelson, who I uh, shared the stage with at Seattle. Actually, a uh, wonderful, great leader, a longtime leader, super experienced grocer, uh, and he is the named successor. So, congratulations to both uh, Daryl and Jamie. Yeah, no, absolutely. A great guy. He was our first CEO on our podcast uh, yep. of a of a major uh, food chain. So uh, yeah, it's and he's a, he's just a great guy. If you you've never actually had a chance to meet meet him, he's just down to earth, solid of the earth kind of guy. And yep. uh, yeah, so it's it's been great to to know him, and I wish him all the best. Fantastic. Well, he's always been generous with me, generous with his insights, and uh, I've had the interview to opportunity to interview him a couple times, and uh, I'll miss seeing him, but I wish him. Uh, I wish him all the best in his uh, in his retirement, and uh, for Jamie, good luck, man. It's uh, it's going to be fun. So, looking forward to seeing what happens as Patterson Food Group o- opens up. Uh, they're going opening up all kinds of different formats, maybe consolidating formats. Maybe they got too many formats. Maybe they don't have enough. Right, over to you, Jamie. All right. Well, that is the news. That is the show for this week. Uh, thanks for tuning in, and uh, Sylvain, you'll be back home in nova scotia next week i'll still be back here actually i'm off to saskatchewan next week. oh okay you're gonna be in saskatchewan oh sorry in saskatchewan what am i saying calgary <laughs> calgary <laughs> all right so where are you gonna be next week calgary calgary all right Cal-town. fantastic fantastic uh well listen until then next week i'm michael blanc media entrepreneur 
consumer uh, strategy advisor, and a bunch of other stuff that I don't always remember, and you are? I'm the food professor, <laughs> Sylvain Chalabois. All right, everybody. Safe travels. Take care.